Well, we are in uh, Luke um, chapter 5, and uh, we have titled this The Gathering and Teaching of Disciples. This runs all the way from chapter 5 to the end of chapter 6, and uh, we're taking this, this portion of Luke section by section as we walk through it. Let's pray together, and we'll get into it this morning. Father, thank you for the scripture that you give us to guide us, teach us, instruct us. Thank you for what it presents to us about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd give us insight into your word as we commit it to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're into this section, which I've entitled Repentance here. And um, let's just pull that down there a little bit. So you can see on the screen here that we're moving through several sections in this gathering and teaching disciples. Jesus is um, gathering disciples to follow him. And uh, we have these displays of power, the miracles and so on. They're taking place. There'll be a number of things that he says in this section that will conclude with the Sermon on the Plain, which uh, gives to us um, an extended version of his teaching. But in this section right here, we saw last week, uh, the theme was forgiveness as Jesus was teaching. And uh, he had representatives of all the Pharisees from throughout the land, from Judea down to uh, Galilee, down to Judea, and even Jerusalem, all present. And Jesus um, had presented in front of him a paralytic man who, and he pronounced the man's sins forgiven, the forgiveness of sins. It was a shocking statement for him to do that. Nobody in the history of the Bible has ever presumed to declare somebody's sins forgiven. And the response of the religious leaders who are listening to him say that, that, you know, only God can do that. And so the consequence is either he is God or he's committing blasphemy. They choose the blasphemy route. Uh, who he is is being revealed to them. In fact, in that scene, it was being revealed because he demonstrated his authority. He said, in order that you may know that the Son of Man is authority to forgive sins on earth, he says, I say to you, uh, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And so the man did that, and they were all shocked, and they were all amazed. And the only thing they conclude is that they had seen astounding things. But um, the fact that he could do that, and, and only God can heal, and only God can forgive sins, and he said the man's sins were forgiven, and he heals him, um, is a is an incredible display of not only power but authority. Now, in this section here, the theme is repentance, and um, it's very interesting here. I just make a note that in Luke he has put these two incidents together. Now, Luke is following a a narrative chronology that is essentially the same that you have in Mark. And it's pretty much the chronology of events that Matthew gives. The gospel writers do not always follow an exact chronology. They have a thematic grouping of the incidents that they tell about Jesus. Sometimes it's following an actual chronology, a historical chronology, but sometimes it's just a narrative chronology, all right? Uh, but what Luke has combined here in what we saw last week and today is the connection of these two themes, repentance and forgiveness. And the th reason why that's interesting is because they appear again at the end of the gospel, where Jesus commissions his followers to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. And in the book of Acts, from the beginning all the way to the end, the theme is repentance and the forgiveness of sins. 
And so that's what we're seeing in the gospel here, where Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, pronounces the forgiveness of sins and calls people to repentance. This will be the ministry that he gives to his uh, disciples at the end, and it's going to be the theme of the good news about Jesus all the way through the book of Acts. Now, let's read the narrative here um, that we have, and then we'll look at it uh, bit by bit. So in chapter 5, um, verse 27, Luke writes, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So we look at this here, and we start here in verse um, 27. He went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. Now, who is Levi? It's very interesting that Mark also refers to this tax collector as Levi and calls him Levi, the son of Altheus. We don't know anything more about Altheus, except that in the list of disciples that's coming up in our study in this section in, the, in a couple of weeks, we'll see the list of the 12 disciples. There's two Jameses in there. Uh, there's a James who is the brother of John, but there's another James, and he's identified as James, son of Alpheus. Uh, is this the same Alpheus that's uh, the father of Levi, according to Mark? We don't know. Alpheus may have been a common name. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's possible if, if uh, Levi and... James were brothers, you might expect that in the list of disciples, they'd be listed together, like Peter and Andrew. Uh, the other, um, the other um, gospel, of course, is gospel of Matthew, and Matthew identifies this as Matthew. Okay? Levi is Matthew, and in the list of the 12 disciples, no Levi is mentioned but Matthew is mentioned in every one of the Gospels. And so that's interesting. Uh, it seems that this Levi had another name or acquired another name, like Simon acquired the name Peter. Okay. So Levi acquired the name Matthew. Matthew means a gift from God. And it's very interesting that this tax collector who's taking gifts. <laughs> They're not exactly gifts, are they, mm -hmm. uh, from people, um, becomes known as one who is himself a gift of God. Well, at any rate, um, there is this tax collector. Now, there are a lot of taxes. Do we have a lot of taxes today? Yes. There's all kinds, aren't there? And there are all kinds of taxes in those days, too. There are taxes from the Romans, taxes from Herod, taxes from the temple. There's all kinds of taxes from all of these tax authorities. Uh, then, and what they had back there in those days might be called tax farmers. Um, and what they did was, in most cases, is that they were in business. <clears throat> they actually paid to the tax authority, the tax, and um, and that would guarantee the tax authority they got their money, and then they would turn around and extract the money from the people. Okay, so um, the in this situation with this Levi at a tax booth, it is more likely what he is is a toll collector. 
That was one of the taxes. There was a major road coming down the Rift Valley uh, following the Jordan River, which fed into the Sea of Galilee. And then, of course, flows out of the Sea of Galilee down toward the Dead Sea. That whole valley, which is pretty low in elevation, is called the Rift Valley, and it extends all the way into Africa. Okay, But uh, because of that, because of that, now, there's a road that came down there, and Capernaum sat uh, on the boundary between the territory of Herod Antipas and Philip. Um, on the other side of the Jordan, just to the, so it would be just to the east of Capernaum is where the Jordan would flow into the Sea of Galilee. On the other side of the Jordan sat Bethsaida. Uh, which you know from the gospel story, Philip was from Bethsaida, okay? And, uh, but Bethsaida lay in the territory of Philip, sometimes called Herod Philip, okay? Now, <clears throat> whenever these people that are transporting goods would cross into a new territory, they taught, crossed into a new tax authority. <laughs> and so there were toll collectors, that were collecting the toll on the goods that were being shipped uh, that would enter into, into the new territory. So that, that apparently was Levi's responsibility. He was a toll collector from the best that we can tell. And he was, he was taking that you know, from the goods that came in there. Now, Jesus calls him. Uh, one thing you know in the Gospel of Luke is this is not the first time you hear about tax collectors. In Luke chapter 3, when uh, Luke was telling you about the ministry of John the Baptist, he said that tax collectors had sought John out. So um, we read here in uh, verse 12 of, John, of Luke verse chapter 3, Luke 3, 12, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said, collect no more than you are authorized to do. So tax collectors have already appeared in this gospel, and that's a unique reference. Um, the other gospel writers talking about John the Baptist don't mention that part. And Luke is also going to talk about a very interesting incident in uh, a parable of Jesus involving a tax collector later in the gospel that's only here in Luke. So Luke has kind of a special interest. And uh, maybe the fact that Levi, who is also known as Matthew, uh, was, you know, a disciple and a follower of Jesus, uh, maybe uh, gave Luke a special interest and maybe even some inside information about tax collectors. What we find in Luke 3 is that some tax collectors were already followers of John the Baptist. And maybe this Levi, who apparently was also called Matthew, was already a follower of John the Baptist. As the Gospel of John tells us that Peter's brother Andrew was already a follower of John the Baptist and Philip was already a follower of John the Baptist. So some of the disciples were already connected to John, and John's gospel tells us that um, they heard when John identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, um, the other gospel writers tell us that this incident with Levi took place in Capernaum. So uh, Peter and Andrew are already there in Capernaum. Jesus has already been ministering in Capernaum. He's already healed practically the entire population of Capernaum. He has demonstrated incredible and amazing power in Capernaum. And Levi would have known all of that. Uh, so when Jesus goes out to talk with him, he's what is he doing? Well, he's just doing his job. <laughs> he's, he's at work. Okay. And uh, Jesus calls him and says, follow me. 
and leaving everything, he rose to follow him. He left the tax booth. Now, we don't know whether he just got up and left all the money and everything and walked away from it. Um, probably not. Probably uh, he had other people working with him. From what we can tell, as in the next verse, he was rather wealthy. So he may have not been a sole proprietor in his tax collection business. But um, at any rate, he did leave his occupation. And that's an interesting thing about following Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. A little later in Luke 9, uh, he tells someone to follow him. And they, and they say, well, I, I'll do that, but, but first I need, to, I need to go do this. And he rebukes them. And he says, um, if you put your hand on the plow and you look backward, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. To follow Jesus is, a, is an all-commitment following. What does it mean to follow him? Uh, they're going to be with him throughout his whole ministry. The point was made in Acts chapter 1 when they have to replace Judas, that they want to follow, they want to find somebody who was with him through the entire ministry. In other words, they were with him, they saw him, they heard him, not just that they saw him, there he is, but they followed his course of life. And he became um, a pattern and a model for the life that he displayed. And so that the one who is a disciple, the one who follows him, has the imprint of that model and that pattern in his own life. This is what Levi is called to do. He is leaving his occupation to take up a full-time following of Jesus. Now, you know, in our experience of knowing the Lord and walking with the Lord, it's not the case that everyone, um, that, that nobody has other occupations. We have other occupations. Paul, in fact, says in his letter to the Thessalonians that, you know, people need to work. <laughs> they don't work. They don't eat. So you need you need to work and, you know, you have these occupations, but we're still called to follow Jesus in a daily type of response so that his pat the pattern of his life becomes imprinted upon us. And that's what Levi then proceeded to do. He he got up. He left everything to follow Jesus. Verse 29, and Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others there. Um, so we have this group of tax collectors. This is These are Levi's business and professional colleagues, okay? They're in the profession of tax collecting, <laughs> of toll gatherer. And I don't know, maybe they have a society of toll gatherers you know they, they meet occasionally and right? they network you know so they know each other but what is this showing us in the gospel one of one of the places of witness is the professional network <laughs> we have you know all kind of, we have neighborhood connections we have personal friendships we also have uh professional connections with other people all of these are avenues for a witness and a testimony to Jesus. And uh, so what Levi does is he brings in the rest of these tax collectors. Now, some of these people, as I said, may have been followers of John the Baptist. Some of them are just curious because remember, Luke has already told us that the word about Jesus is going out everywhere. So Levi has, has presenting his fellow tax collectors with an opportunity to have lunch with Jesus. I mean, how great is that? You know, I mean, the crowds, we already know from the previous incidents, the crowds are so thick, you can't get through to see him. You, you can't get through to get close to him. 
So Levi has created an opportunity to do that for these people. And so when they get the invitation, hey, invited to lunch with Jesus, they're in. So they're there and they're sitting around the table with Jesus there and uh, reclining at the table because that's the way, you know, in, in the Roman times when they would eat, they would, you know, just, I don't know how you actually eat that well, you know, I mean, you have to kind of sit up for to go down, you know, <laughs> but anyway, they did that. And so, uh, <clears throat> but there they were around the table and uh, with Levi and with Jesus, by the way, on the notes, um, the section C there, what it means to follow Jesus. I just wanted to comment a little more on that um, because, uh, you know, what, what we're talking about is a model of complete change. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, the, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. There is a change from the old to the new, a complete, a complete uh, abandonment of the old and a coming of the new. So the personal following of Jesus and Levi leaving everything and following him is, a, is an illustration of what's happening on the spiritual level, where the old life is completely gone and the new has come. In fact, we're called into that, um, into the experience of that movement from the old to the new. And uh, that's what you have with Jesus. That's what you have in the resurrection from the dead, is that there is an abandonment of the old and there's a coming into the new. Uh, and that's what we experience on a personal basis. Now, let's look down here. At the next verse, verse 30, the objection of the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and their scribes grumble at his disciples. So it's evident the disciples were there at the meal um, and said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, the key to understanding this is understanding the Pharisees and what their scruples are here. Uh, and this is a problem that extends all the way through the gospel narrative and into the epistles of the New Testament. What was the problem with the Pharisees? <clears throat> the Pharisees um, were concerned about God's requirements for holiness. But what they did was to make sure that they were really, really holy and never, ever in a position to be defiled. This Bible requires certain holiness requirements. It has um, uh, these laws uh, for cleanliness and so on with regard to food and all kinds of things. The Pharisees looked at the scripture. The scripture has very severe strictures on priests who serve in the temple, but not on the people. The Pharisees believed that if the people would follow the same strictures as the priest in the temple, you'd never be in a situation of violating God's holiness. So that's what they taught. People need to follow the holiness requirements of priests serving in the temple. And that included even this uh, eating and drinking with um, people who were sinners and this sort of thing. You had to stay away and be completely undefiled, and everybody has to do that. So um, there is a, a one, one writer wrote, Pharisees interpreted the holiness of the temple as extending to their own households. The ritual purity required a priest serving in the temple extended to their tables. The food that was eaten has to be ritually clean, and the one you eat it with has to be ritually clean. And if they're not, then you're in violation. 
So that's what they, that's their rules. And they, they're uh, astonished because Jesus is obviously a great rabbi. He's a great teacher and he's doing these great works of power. So surely he must be holy, which means he must fit with their understanding of the holiness code. They don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. And Jesus answers them with two answers here. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So he gives them a kind of a proverbial answer there. And then he says, I have not come to call the righteous, righteous but sinners to, um, to repentance. So the first point of the people who are well don't need a physician, only those who are sick, was actually kind of a well-known thing. I mean, it's an obvious point, isn't it? Where are you going to find a doctor? With the sick people. <laughs> that's pretty obvious. I mean, they're in a hospital. Who else is in there? Sick people. I mean, that's why, you know, they're there because they need the help of the physician. So a couple of quotations here from the uh, writers uh, of that time. Um, Greek writers, Dio Chrysostom, wrote medicines are for the sick, but they're not, they're superfluous for the healthy. And Diogenes uh, Laertius wrote, uh, when he renamed a certain Greek doctor, was once reviled because he with, was, was with bad people. He said doctors, uh, too, are among the sick, but they don't catch the fever. So doctors are to be there where the sick are. If you apply that to what Jesus' situation is, he's with people who are sinners, but he doesn't contract the sin, just like healing the leper in the uh, just in the few verses earlier. You don't touch a leper. A Pharisee would never touch a leper. You'd be, if you catch contagion, you become defiled. You, you don't want to maintain holiness. So you don't touch the leper. Jesus touches the leper and he doesn't become defiled. Rather, the le leper becomes healed. So he says those who are well uh, don't need a physician, but those who are sick. Now, they asked him, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They've thrown tax collectors and sinners together in the same category. The real issue is, why are you eating with sinners? And when he says this, so is he claiming to be a physician of sinners? I mean, that would be the implication, right? I mean, he is a healer. He's been showing his, he's healed practically everybody in Capernaum, no matter of what they're sick, even the demon possessed. So he's, he's uh, healing people, but is he a healer of sin? This is what Luke is showing you in this incident here. This is what's coming out through the comment of Jesus. They're saying, why are you with sinners? He says, because the sick need a physician. And sinners need a healer, a healing from sin. So he is a physician to sinners. And then he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's hard, I think, sometimes to understand that because um, there's a couple of things that are going on. These two verses here, 31 and 32, are really interesting to kind of unpack some stuff. And we don't have a lot of time to unpack a lot of stuff. But uh, what we understand with the word repentance is usually understood within respect or with respect to our presentation of the gospel to someone who does not yet believe. And so we speak of repentance as being a change of mind with respect to the gospel and its truthfulness. And consequently, with that change of mind, by faith, they receive the good news and receive forgiveness of sins from Jesus. And all of that is right. All of that fits the concept of repentance, which is metanoia, which means a change of mind, and so on. But Jesus here is not talking about the change of mind in order to begin to believe. 
what he's talking about here fits with the call of Levi. Because repentance is, we also refer to repentance by the word conversion. And whereas we typically focus on the initial conversion that happens when a person first believes the gospel, conversion in the, in the Bible, uh, the turning and the repentance that is conversion is talking about a change of life. It's from the old to the new. The old has passed away. The new has come. That turn from the old to the new is conversion. And that is the full meaning of repentance. He called Levi to follow him. He's talking about that here when he says, I came to call sinners to repentance. Well, that certainly begins with a change of mind to follow Jesus. You have to make that initial repentance in order to then trust him. And we put a box around that and want to have all these arrows pointing at that. And that's right, that you need to do that. One of the reasons why we need to do that is because the, the latter part of the lifelong following him has been misused theologically. So <clears throat> let me explain that real quick. Uh, he's talking about sin as a sickness, is he not? People need a physician. The sick need a physician. Why are you eating with sinners? Because the sick, that is the sinners, need a physician, a healer from sin. That notion had a Profound effect in the beginning of the history of the church, understanding that um, salvation was like a medicine for the sick, that sin is a sickness that infuses itself through an entire life, and you needed a medicine to cure that, and the medicine is really Jesus. It's the power of Jesus. The problem is that by the end of the fourth century uh, in the history of the church, they institutionalized that so that the medicine became identified with the sacraments of the church. And so the way you get the medicine is you go there and you take the sacrament, and that's the medicine. And that's true in Roman Catholic theology today. You just keep taking the medicine. See, medicine is to be taken daily, right? I mean, it's to be taken periodically. You just keep taking it. That's what you do with medicine. And so the idea is that you keep taking that and that somehow, well, what's lost in all this? Well, there's another aspect. The previous, the previous incident here where he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, not they will be if you keep taking the medicine, and then we'll check you at the end of your life and see if you got well enough to be considered spiritually well. He didn't say that. He said to him, your sins are forgiven. That part of it is extremely critical in understanding salvation. One receives from Jesus a pronouncement of the complete forgiveness of sins. And that's received by faith. That's that initial metanoia. That's the initial repentance, which then turns to him in faith and receives that forgiveness. And that's what Paul goes on to talk about justification. That is the standing of righteousness. He considers us righteous. It took about 1,100 years for the church to get that right in understanding Paul to the rest of the scripture. But then what happened is that some people who are really focused on that extremely critical and important point miss this other point, that there is this ongoing converting, turning, and healing of the problem of sin. It's in our hymns. Uh, Rock of Ages has that um, distinction, saved from the penalty and from the power of sin. 
two things. The penalty is saved from when you receive forgiveness of sins. But there is this ongoing work of the power of Jesus in one's life. And that's a daily strengthening and flourishing in the fruit of the Spirit, manifesting the power of Christ. And that comes from walking with him, like Levi was called to do, and the other disciples were called to do, to walk with him and to imprint his life on their own lives. So these things are here in the, lang the language of the gospel is pointing in these directions. I suggest to you. Two approaches to sin and sinners. They close this out. There are the Pharisees. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't want to touch them. <laughs> no, I want to be holy before God. And so to be holy before God is have nothing to do uh, with them. Jesus' response is, we want to heal them. We want to forgive them. And we want to bring them into healing, spiritual healing. That's what, that's the ministry of Jesus. I do recall that uh, several years ago, you know, you remember the 70s? Hallelujah. <laughs> so um, it's like a, in a number of churches, a discovery of this point. Mm -hmm. Jesus associated with sinners. And so then th there was this, you know, sort of teaching that, hey, you know, it's okay to do that. But oftentimes among the council, among young Christians, that was communicated in a way that had nothing to do with the conversion power of Jesus. It was rather an excuse to simply associate with unholiness. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's not there at the house of Levi uh, reveling in unholy and ungodly behavior. He is there as the Savior. And what he communicates and what he does is to bring about a change of life from sin to holiness. That's what we're seeing in this early part of the ministry of Jesus, which has to do with gathering and teaching his disciples. Well, we're out of time here, so we're going to go ahead and pray, and we'll close for today. Father, thank you for the example, but especially the teaching of our Lord and Savior. Thank you that he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord, that he came to forgive sins and to bring about the healing of life so that we might walk with you in holiness and true holiness and godliness in the life of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would make us witnesses for you in our everyday contacts and circumstances, those whom we see and meet those whom we know in the various aspects of our lives. We pray that it would be a light and a witness to the gospel of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us in our walk with you. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus and for the teaching, the guiding, and the discipling that he leads us into through the Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.